In Belgium, if a parent feeds their child on a vegan diet, they can go to jail. And a lot of vegans and I agree with that. Absolutely. Vegetarians <laughs> will say, well, I'm not going to offer comment. <laughs> G'day ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Cancel Me Now podcast. My name is Isaac Butterfield. If you're new here, please subscribe wherever you happen to be listening to this, whether it's on YouTube, Spotify, Apple iTunes, something else, who gives a rat? It doesn't matter. The the most important thing is you're listening to it. So hello and welcome. Uh, On today's episode, we have a very interesting gentleman, Dr. Paul Mason. Now he is a expert when it comes to the low carb lifestyle, I think. And I think it's important to run with the term lifestyle rather than diet. Um, It is a different way of living your life. It sort of goes against everything that you're used to. And it's something that I've employed in my life for a long time. Uh, I'm not on a low carb diet at the moment. I'm actually pigging out like a big fat piece of shit that I am. Um, But I tell you what, it is something that I've really enjoyed uh, implementing into my life uh, over the past five or so years. So I think people are going to get a lot out of this conversation. This dude uh, is not only an expert when it comes to nutrition, but also when it comes to the way that the human body works. Uh, f- according to his website here, he has uh, he has a master's in occupational health. He holds degrees in physiotherapy and he, di- and he obtained his medical degree with honours from the University of Sydney and is currently a specialist registrar in the Australian College of Sport and Exercise Medicine. He's worked with the Penrith Panthers, Sydney FC and the men's uh, Australian Australian men's water polo team and the Futsal Roos, whatever that is, um, but it sounds impressive. So this guy is a very interesting gentleman to have on the show, and I hope you enjoy it. If I can, I'll just go through what brought me to begin a ketogenic diet and a low carb diet. Uh, lifestyle, if you will, and how I found out about you. I found out about you through Michaela Peterson. Uh, She put me on to you and I started following you on Twitter and looking at the really interesting things that you were saying in regards to things like a low carb diet. But for me, I started having these, uh, an issue with epilepsy, if you will. Now, the problem I have is it's it's actually called um, paratismal dyskinesia. Uh, I'm sure that means something to you, even to me who has it, means absolutely nothing. But I say epilepsy because my neurologist said it's similar, just say that, it's much easier. Um, so basically what I read was it can help. A low carb or ketogenic diet can help with problems like epilepsy. They give it to kids, or they 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 uh, prescribe it to kids. The diet if they are not responding to medication. Uh, so I started to do that, and I cut out carbs, I cut out sugar, and I ate a high fat, low carb diet. I did not have an issue with this uh, the turn that I was having, and this is what the doctors were calling it a turn. So basically, my head and my eyes turn. Uh, to the left side of my body, I go blind in one eye. And it lasts like that. I remain um, uh, conscious throughout the entire thing. And it lasts like that for about 15 seconds, absolute max. So I was having one of these every couple of months, let's say, particularly when I was playing uh, football because one of the triggers was a, a collision or a quick movement of the eyes or something like that that would trigger it. So I jumped on the keto diet and they stopped. And as a byproduct, I was I was about 134 kilos. And as a byproduct, I lost an enormous amount of weight. I got down to about 94, 95 kilos. And so I'm six foot eight. So obviously that's quite a low number. Um, and I was feeling great. All of a sudden I was running these mad distances. I was beating people at training, all those type of things. Things I was never able to do. And everyone said to me, that's not healthy. You're eating too much meat, too much saturated fat, all of those types of things. And I'm sure that that's the, the feedback that you get anytime you talk about these, these, these diets or these lifestyle changes. For me, it was something that I did research about. I listened to people uh, on the subject and realized that, okay, maybe saturated fat isn't the devil that we're all terrified of. Okay, yes, eggs have cholesterol in them, but is that dietary cholesterol going to translate to bad cholesterol in uh, in the bloodstream? There was an enormous amount of pushback from people who I spoke to. And I wondered, 
maybe today we could talk about what the ketogenic diet is, how it can help people, or a low carb variant, perhaps. I'm, I'm not sure what you what you prefer or what you prescribe, um, and just give people a, an understanding of what that entire world is. Sure. Well, there's also two interesting points that you talked about there, and that's people's fear of saturated fat and meat. So I think saturated fat is the elephant in the room. So that's probably the first one that we should deal with. But in essence, a ketogenic diet is a diet where you reduce the carbohydrate intake sufficiently so that your body burns fat and turns that fat into something called ketones. Basically, a ketogenic diet is a description of your body burning fat, making something called ketones, and then using those ketones for fuel. And with reference to what was, you had uh, diagnosed as paroxysmal dyskinesia, which is uh, basically in medicine, by the way, we like to uh, confuse people by putting really complex words onto simple descriptions. Paroxysmal just means something that occurs suddenly and dyskinesia basically translates into, a, say, a poor movement. So when they said paroxysmal dyskinesia, they're really saying, oh, you just had these movements that occur suddenly. That's literally all they said back to you. But anyway, yeah, right. that's that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know that. Thanks, Doc. <laughs> and that's, that's that's medicine in a nutshell. Yeah. You know, let, let's confuse things. Let's confuse people. Let's even confuse the actual doctors so they don't know what's right and what's wrong. Now, the beautiful thing about ketones is that the body loves it for energy, especially the brain. And it's long been known that a brain that's burning ketones operates absolutely fabulously. There's been this myth that's been propagated for, I don't know how long, over 100 years, and it's been dispelled way back in the 1960s, that you must have carbohydrates for the brain to function. Well, that's complete and utter bunkum. It's absolutely not true at all. You can literally ingest zero carbohydrates and be in fantastic, robust health. And there are some cells in the body, like the red blood cells or some of the cells in the eye, that do need glucose, which is a carbohydrate. And you know what? If your body needs that glucose, it will make that glucose. The body has a process called gluconeogenesis, which means making glucose, and that will work if your carbohydrate intake is low enough that it needs to. Mm. So basically a, a ketogenic diet is just a very low carbohydrate diet. Now, if we take carbohydrates out of the diet, then that means that the two other macronutrients need to be increased. So that's higher in protein and higher in fat. And the fat is the thing that everybody gets worked up on because once upon a time, we came up with a little fairy tale. Some bloke, uh, Nikolai Anakov, he was a Russian scientist. He decided to force feed rabbits, you know, these little, you know, fluffy things that eat grass. He force fed rabbits pure cholesterol and he found that they developed problems with the heart. So he developed this theory that uh, cholesterol caused heart disease. And then this other guy, uh, he, Antel Keys, he came up with the theory, well, eating saturated fat increases the cholesterol in your blood. Therefore, that too must cause heart disease. This was based on an experiment where they fed rabbits cholesterol. You can't make this stuff up. And there's a long line of dominoes that continues from there. But basically, that meant that we have our current dietary guidelines that has us completely and utterly fearful of saturated fat. The simple fact is, though, that saturated fat has never been proven to be unhealthy. And in actual fact, there's been several studies, good quality studies that have proved its safety that have actually been covered up. So I'll tell you about three of them. So we'll start with one called the Sydney Diet and Heart Study because Sydney, that's where I live. This is where I practice. So this was done in the late 60s and early 70s. And they took men who had had heart attacks and they took the saturated fat out of their diet, out of some of them diet. So it's a randomised trial. So basically what that means is they, they give some of them the intervention and some of them they leave as a control, and that way they can compare the difference between the two groups. This is how real science is done. So in the control group, they said, keep eating as you will. In the intervention group, they said, take out that saturated fat and have this vegetable oil. And what they found 
was that the men who reduced their saturated fat and ingested more vegetable oil, this so-called poly, healthy polyunsaturated fat, their mortality increased 62%. Think about that. Vegetable oil, you die more. But then why haven't you heard about it? Because the researchers, they never published the results. It was quite literally this, remember, this finished, I think it was in 1973, this study finished. The results weren't published until 2013. And that was after somebody, an investigator, he had heard about this study and wondered where this data was. And he tracked down one of the original investigators or one of their children, if they'd passed away. And he literally uncovered the data still on punch cards sitting oh. in somebody's basement. And he went to great lengths to decode it and they cross-referenced the data, et cetera, et cetera, and they, they met modern standards. And then they said, well, this is a huge finding. So it ended up being published in British Medical Journal, one of the world's most prestigious journals in 2013. Basically, you know, if this had been published back then, we'd never have gotten on the bandwagon of this whole food pyramid nonsense. And about the same time, there was another study called the Minnesota Coronary Survey, and this was over a double-blinded randomised control trial of over 9,000 subjects. And that too was hidden. The full results weren't published until they were uncovered again. You can't make this up in another basement. And it was published in British Medical Journal in 2016. The results, reducing saturated fat in the diet, increased mortality. That is, if you eat less saturated fat, you are more likely to die. So what, what was happening in the late 60s, early 70s that would account for this being... Um, hidden. I know that this is the sort of time where the the sugar industry. Everyone talks about the sugar industry was hiding mm. things. Is this the same sort of like cabal, if you will, that was happening in Australia as it was in America? No. Well, there, so the Minnesota Coronary Survey was in the US. Um, so this was worldwide. Basically, yeah. it was at the behest of one guy called Ansel Keys who had truly brought into this lipid heart hypothesis that cholesterol and saturated fat would kill you. And they truly believed that. So cognitive dissonance came to the fore and they were prepared to ignore whatever evidence didn't fit their narrative. It's basically the corruption of the scientific process. But it wasn't limited to just back then. So we come back to, you know, the 21st century in 2006. Have you ever heard of the Women's Health Initiative study? The world's most expensive study, 700 million US dollars. Wow. Okay. No, I have not. Went for eight years, published in 2006. So they took about 48,000 females. They reduced the saturated fat in their diet um, and followed them and saw what happened. And when it was published, they said, well, you know, we didn't find any benefit. Uh, probably we didn't reduce the saturated fat enough. To get benefit, we need to reduce saturated fat more. So the results of this study were promoted as encouraging or needing a larger reduction in saturated fat. But here's where the academic fraud, and I don't use that term lightly because it appeared there's never been a good explanation. In the results table, there was no results in the conclusion, so on and so forth, no significant results. But buried on page 661 of this study, there was a single sentence that was quite obscure that basically implied that the females who went on the low-fat diet, the reduced-fat diet, were 26% more likely to have cardiovascular complication. Now, this is absolutely huge. And this was basically never acknowledged and hidden. And recently, just late last year, there was a follow-up paper that was published where they again tried to hide their results. And this was basically an expose by my friend, Professor Timothy Noakes from South Africa. And he actually has uncovered data that showed that at, after a further five years follow-up in the Women's Health Initiative, those females on the reduced fat diets, well, their problem or their risk of developing coronary heart disease complications after a further five years had increased to somewhere between 47 and 61%. So the longer you're on the reduced fat diet, the worse the complications. And most people, doctors included, especially doctors, have absolutely no idea that this evidence has been hidden from view. And there is literally zero good evidence that we should avoid saturated fat at all. The biggest reason people fail to follow a diet is because they're hungry, full mm. stop. Now, if you're put on a diet that says you can eat as much as you want, 
where's the hunger? Now, sure, you will still have food cravings because a lot of people are addicted to sugar and sweets and things like that, and they have trouble distinguishing between what is a genuine sense of hunger and just when some neurons within their brain need a little bit of excitement. Mm. But the fact is the ketogenic diet is absolutely sustainable, and I've got dozens and dozens of patients who have been on it for five years longer, even people, you know, 10 years have been on low-carbohydrate and ketogenic-style diets. And if we do want to go back to epidemiological research, um, if, you, if you've got to trust it. So there's this uh, big study called the EPIC Oxford, Uni- uh, Oxford study um, run out of Oxford University in uh, the UK, and that found that non-meat eaters were 49% more likely to suffer bowel cancer than meat eaters. So that, that goes against the whole idea of fibre, right? to clean out your bowel and all that. That's what we were taught in school. Like you got to eat a lot well, of fiber. Exactly, cause it- just process that for a minute. People who didn't eat meat in the Epic Oxford study yep. were 49% more likely to get bowel cancer. It doesn't just go against it. I mean, it sort of yeah, spits in the, face of it. the whole argument. Yeah. So, and when we're talking about sustainability and, and these kind of things, um, so of uh, meat-based diets. So in 1906, there was this, uh, this researcher called Wilhelmer uh, Stefansson. He was a Harvard anthropologist. And he went to live with the Inuit in the Canadian Arctic. And he lived there for a year eating exactly like the native Inuit. So he basically, you know, had seal and eggs when they were available for about a month of the year, lots of caribou and basically no plants. And he was really surprised. He was in robust health. And so when he got back, everybody's like, yeah, nah, you're lying. That's not possible. So he agreed to be part of an experiment in 1926. So the experiment started. He and another guy went to a hospital in New York and they were fed an exclusive meat diet. And over the 12 months, there were genuine fears that these two guys would kill themselves, that they would die. And in the report afterwards, the commentary was along the lines of, surprisingly, both men remained in robust health. So you, we know that you can survive on meat, solely on meat, and do very well. And you've probably heard about the Maasai. So the, the African tribe. Yep. So that's a largely carnivorous tribe. So in 1931, there was a paper that, uh, that studied the Maasai and an adjacent tribe that was predominantly vegetarian, the Akakuyu. And what they actually found, that the Maasai were five inches taller on average, 50% stronger, and they had far less bone disease, less anemia, less respiratory issues, less ulcers, less bony deformities. In general, the near predominant carnivores were far, far healthier, taller and stronger than the vegetarians. And don't for a second think that this is an anomaly. So throughout human history, we've studied, so agriculture came on about 10 or 12,000 years ago when uh, human societies, for whatever reason, decided that they'd start farming grains. And if you have a look at the fossil record, you will actually see that humans were taller with bigger brains 10,000 years ago than they are today. Right. On average, 10,000 year years ago, the average brain size was 1,500 cubic centimetres. Today, it's 1,300 cubic centimetres. And quite literally, this is a direct effect of transitioning from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to a farming-type lifestyle. And we've got lots of research on this today about the effects of vegetarian and vegan diets on the brain. The simple fact is the brain is two-thirds fat. Mm. It needs fat. So, And a good 20 25% of that is what we call DHA fat, an omega-3 fat that you don't get from plant foods, you get from animal foods. There's other nutrients like zinc and iron, which are B12, which are absolutely essential for brain function. So they've done studies where they've shown that if you have iron deficiency and they give you an iron infusion, um, that your IQ improves, your performance on IQ tests improves. Really? They, they did a study at uh, Sydney University. So there's a supplement called uh, creatine. It's only from flesh. And they found 
that when they supplemented vegetarians with this substance, their IQ increased, but not an omnivore or somebody who's already eating creatine in their diet. So there can be absolutely no doubt that a vegetarian or vegan diet is not as healthy or nourishing for the brain. In actual fact, in Belgium, if a parent feeds their child on a vegan diet, they can go to jail. And a lot of vegans and I agree with that. Absolutely. <laughs> vegetarians <laughs> will say, well, I'm not going to offer comment. A lot of vegan <laughs> vegetarians, they will claim, but we know about these deficiencies and so we correct for them. So first of all, there's a bunch more things that are deficient on a vegetarian diet that people aren't aware of. You just have to ask them what they're doing for choline and just watch their face glaze over. But I guess the question a lot of people want to know, because I talk about this a lot, I talk about the idea of soy boys. The idea that someone becomes less masculine or less of a man, if you will, um, whatever that means, because of the amount of soy consumption. Now, is there any science pointing to soy consumption increasing estrogen or making men more likely to grow breast tissue or shrinking of the testes, those type of things? So, yeah, so it, it is known that soy does have some estrogenic effects. So, you you know, whether or not you actually see symptoms of a magnitude that you'll detect in a study, you can't argue the base science that it will actually increase estrogen levels, which is a female hormone. Mm. Um, and that this, these kind of compounds take lavender oil. So there was a case of a boy who developed gynecomastia, a young child, um, because he was having a bath in lavender oil, and that also has estrogenic effects. Wow. So there's other chemicals that we're exposed to. So this is not some kind of, uh, you know, random mythical thing that could never happen. We do anything that has estrogenic effects has potential to cause these impacts. Also, with regards to uh, vegans and vegetarian males who are having very low fat diets because plants don't have a lot of fat, they need to understand that saturated fat does increase cholesterol, sure. Cholesterol is the base ingredient for testosterone. Low cholesterol levels are associated with low testosterone levels. That is a fact. Is something... Is tests like the one of the first things you look at for health in a man? It's the last thing I want to look at. Yeah? Like test testosterone. <laughs> ah, I thought you were talking about testicles. No, 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 no. But, but hey, fair enough. I'm, I'm glad we have your opinion on that. But as far as testosterone, because I know a lot of men now are taking testosterone replacement therapy later on into their, into their older years. Is that something you look at for health in a man uh, early on in sort of a, uh, when you're going through how someone yes. is feeling? So there are several ways we look at testosterone. One of the problems is that it's not just a matter of doing a blood test and saying how much testosterone is in your serum because we've got another um, – protein called sex hormone binding globulin that circulates around and that actually binds to testosterone. And the theory is that testosterone is only able to be active when it's been let go by this sex hormone binding globulin. So, but definitely um, there are certain conditions that we do see um, very low testosterone levels in. Uh, one of the most common is actually inflammatory bowel disease, which is an autoimmune, which basically means your body attacks itself um, condition of the gut, basically the intestines and the stomach region. And it's not uncommon at all that patients with this condition will have low testosterone levels and that will improve when they reduce the plant foods in their diet. Uh, yeah, uh, I hear I'm